Chapter 4 Frightened Grandparents Several quick-acting pedestrians caught Nancy just before she hit the pavement. Are you hurt? exclaimed a middle-aged woman as she helped the girl to her feet. I saw that awful woman push you. Were you trying to catch her? Nancy took a deep breath and said, Yes, she stole my purse, then added, I'm all right. Thanks so much. Suddenly, Nancy spotted the thief hurrying into Brent's department store down the street. She dashed after her and hastened through the revolving doors. Looking around quickly, Nancy saw a flash of pink near the bank of elevators. By the time she reached them, the woman had gone up in one of the cars. Nancy darted to the nearby escalator and rushed up two steps at a time. On the second floor, she sped to the elevators, but saw by the indicator light that the car she wanted had already left. The woman was not in sight. What luck, Nancy murmured, darting back to the escalator. A few moments later, she arrived breathless on the third floor. As Nancy looked toward the elevator, the door was starting to close. No one was inside. The woman she was after must have stepped off here. May I help you? asked a sales girl. We have some lovely... No, no, Nancy panted. I'm after a thief, a woman in a pink print dress. Did you see her get off the elevator? The girl's eyes grew wide. A thief, she exclaimed. Why, yes, I did see her, but I don't know where she went. What did she take? My purse, said Nancy. I'll get my supervisor, said the sales girl. Nancy glanced around the third floor, where many customers were examining racks of dresses. Where could the woman be hiding? Dressing rooms, Nancy decided. She saw that the fall clothes department had fewer customers than the others. I'll start there. She hastened across the floor and peered through an archway into a narrow aisle. There was a row of curtained cubicles along one wall. Quietly, Nancy peeked into the first room. Empty. In the next, a stout woman was struggling into a tight dress. She did not see Nancy. Quickly, the young detective moved along the row of dressing rooms. In the fifth room, she found the thief. The woman was leaning against the wall, panting. Nancy's open handbag lay on a shelf beside her, and in one hand the woman clutched the gold chain bracelet. I'll take that, Nancy said, stepping into the cubicle. The woman froze in amazement for a moment, then swiftly seized the handbag and hurled it at Nancy. As the girl ducked, the contents scattered and the woman tried to dash past. Nancy seized her wrist and caught hold of the bracelet. Help! Thief! she shouted. Instantly, the woman let go of the gold chain, broke free, and raced into the corridor with Nancy at her heels. The thief darted through the arch, but as Nancy reached it, two saleswomen arrived, blocking the way. What happened? one asked. That woman in pink! Nancy exclaimed. I must stop her! She darted around the sales ladies and ran toward the elevators. Too late. She saw the thief board a car just before the door closed. How to stop her? Suddenly, Nancy spotted a store telephone behind a nearby counter. She hurried to it and picked up the receiver. Operator, this is an emergency. Ring the phone nearest the entrance on Main Street, please. In a second, a voice said, Silverware. Listen carefully, Nancy said tersely. A large woman in a pink print dress will probably come rushing toward you any minute now, heading for the door. Stop her. She's a thief. Just a moment, said the clerk. There was a pause, then the speaker said, The woman you described passed my counter as we were talking. I ran after her, but she hopped into a taxi and it sped off. Shall I notify the store detective? No, thanks, said Nancy. It's too late. 
Disappointed, she hung up as a voice behind her said, What's going on? Nancy turned around. It was Mr. Mahoney, the store manager. He was surrounded by sales ladies. One gave Nancy her handbag with all the contents restored. Oh, hello, Nancy, said Mr. Mahoney. What's this about a thief in the store? Nancy took him aside and explained briefly. I don't think the woman is an ordinary purse snatcher. She's probably mixed up in a case I'm working on. Well, I hope you catch her, Mr. Mahoney said. He waved goodbye and walked off. Nancy examined her handbag. The strap had been cut. I doubt if that woman knew I had the bracelet with me before she saw it through the jeweler's window. The young detective suspected that Adam Thorne had engaged the thief to trail her. I believe she recognized the bracelet, Nancy told herself, and she'll tell Thorne about it. I hope the old lady who owns it doesn't get into trouble for slipping it to Dr. Spire. Deep in thought as she walked down the street, Nancy did not see a petite, dark-haired young woman hurrying toward her. Nancy! What luck to run into you! Helen Corning! Oh, I'm sorry, Nancy said with a grin. I can't get used to your being Mrs. Archer. How's everything? Oh, just great, except for one thing. Nancy, I was going to call you this very afternoon. How about solving a mystery for me? Seeing her friend's look of interest, she chuckled. I thought that would catch you. Could you come to my apartment tomorrow evening at six? I'll tell you all about it then. Besides, Jim would love to see you. I wouldn't miss it, Nancy replied. But I think it's only fair to tell you I'm already working on a mystery. Helen smiled. Then this is just one more. You're so clever, Nancy. I'm sure you can solve both at once. Nancy laughed. Give me a hint. Helen explained that her grandmother and grandfather Corning had recently moved to Sylvan Lake. They have a dreamy stone house on a hill. It is beautiful. But now Graham and Gramp are afraid to stay there because of something queer that keeps happening. What is it? Nancy asked. Helen glanced at her watch. I'd love to tell you, but I must run. See you tomorrow. We'll drive out to the lake and have dinner with Graham and Gramp. Thanks a million, Nancy. As Helen Archer hurried away, Nancy stood on the sidewalk, musing. Hmm, another case. Then she turned toward home. When Nancy reached it, Effie opened the front door. I heard you drive in, she said in a loud whisper. The pigeon man's here. She gestured toward the living room. He's very good looking. Thank you, said Nancy, and went to greet the caller, hoping he had not heard Effie. A tall blonde man in his twenties got up as she entered. He introduced himself as Donald Jordan, secretary of the local branch of the Pigeon Fanciers Association. He showed her his credentials. I'm so glad you came, said Nancy. Please sit down. I'll get the pigeon and the message. Nancy hurried to the garage and saw with relief that the bird seemed stronger. Oh, I hope Mr. Jordan won't take you away, she murmured to the bird. I want to get you well enough to fly to your home loft. Then I'll follow you. Nancy carried the pigeon to the living room. Mr. Jordan examined the bird gently, noting especially the number on its leg band. Then Nancy took the message from her purse and handed it to him. This is the second pigeon seen in this area with an unregistered number, he said. The other was found dead on the highway. I mentioned it to a detective friend of mine. He thought criminals might be using this means of communication, thinking it's safer than telephone or telegraph or letter. Nancy nodded and told him she had reported the incident to the police. Good. That saves us the trouble. The young man arose. Well, thank you for notifying me, Miss Drew. Now I'll take the bird and... Oh, please don't, Nancy exclaimed. 
Mr. Jordan looked surprised. Surely you don't want to be bothered with a sick pigeon. I don't mind, said Nancy. I'd like to try to nurse it back to health. The young man shook his head. I'm afraid there's not much chance, but if that's what you want, it's okay with me. He made copies of the leg band number and the strange message, then wished her luck and left. Nancy returned the pigeon to the garage. She immediately went to Hannah Gruen's room to tell her about the latest developments in the case. And about time, said the housekeeper. I never hear any news up here. How are you feeling? Nancy asked. Much better. If it wasn't for that fussy doctor, I'd be up and working like I should. Nancy laughed. You just take it easy while you have the chance. Late in the afternoon, Mr. Drew called to say that he could not be home until nine o'clock. To keep Hannah company, Nancy and Effie ate supper on trays in her room and afterward watched a television play. At the end, Effie sniffed in disappointment. Not enough love, she commented. Now that handsome Mr. Kyle should have... She stopped speaking as the front doorbell rang. Dad must have forgotten his key, Nancy remarked. I'll go. She hurried down the stairs and started to open the door. Instinct told the young sleuth to be cautious. She flicked the wall switch to turn on the porch light, then opened the door a crack. The porch was dark. Nancy thought the bulb must have burned out. Dad? Nancy called quickly. There was no answer, but from somewhere in the shadows came the sound of heavy breathing. End of chapter 4